All right, so hi, I'm Juliana DeLuna. I'll be your tour guide today. Um, so I have been doing research on Spanish names since, as I tell the story, 1998 or so, when my then peer um, basically challenged me to answer a question for the Academy of St. Gabriel of happy memory. And I've never looked back since at the end of the last time I was teaching a names class earlier today, somebody said, do you have something with the College of Arms? The answer is yes, yes, I do. Um, six months, up until six months ago, I was Chief Herald of Society. Now I'm done, yay. I did my time as Laurel, had my pretty hat. Okay, sh I still have the pretty hat. By the way, have you guys seen the pretty hat? The Laurel, the Laurel Queen of Arms has the best crown in the known world. It's so good we won't ship it. And of course, because no one's traveling, I haven't gotten it to my successor yet. I will do that sometime later this year. Um, but so I started looking at names in Spain and surrounding areas. I've also done other things as well. But today we're going to be looking at names mostly in Spain. Then we'll talk a little bit about Portugal, about Basque, and about a few other things too. So let's get this show on the road. As I said, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I will not care. All right, so let's start by talking a little bit about language and culture and naming practice to try to make sense out of what's going on historically. So everyone knows where we're talking about with the Iberian Peninsula, I hope, seeing as we've been doing this for several hours now, right? So before the classical world gets going in Spain. There's a whole lot of really interesting linguistic diversity in early Iberia. Most of what's spoken there is part of Celtic language groups, but it's all gonna kind of disappear. So this is all just kind of the undercurrents, know it's there. The Carthaginians and the Greeks both set up colonies along the Mediterranean coast, but where Iberia really gets going in its modern sense is with Rome. So all of Iberia is integrated into the Roman empire. One area is a senatorial area, that is to say that by definition, senators come from there, but emperors do as well. There are multiple emperors who are born in Spain. So when I say that Iberia is integrated into the Roman Empire, this isn't Roman Britain, this is Rome. And basically what happens is every language that's spoken in Iberia disappears except for up in the Northeast area, the language that today in English we call Basque and Spanish we call Vasco and that they themselves call Euskara. So I'm gonna call it Basque from here on out just because I don't wanna confuse people. So now we start out with a new substrate that's Latin or what we're going to call as we move forward Romance. Romance is just a fancy word for all the languages that are derived from the Roman language, that is to say Latin. With the fall of Rome, Visigoths come in speaking a Germanic language and bringing names like Rodrigo and Alvaro, but they keep writing in Latin. Then the Umayyads, who are Arabs and Berbers, come in and take over much of Iberia in the early eighth century. They don't actually have much influence on Spanish naming practice. I taught another class about Arabic naming practice and I'll cheerfully talk to anybody about that outside of this class. But there are lots of Spanish place names that are either Arabic in origin, places like Calatrava and Gibraltar, and other places that aren't Arabic in origin, but the Arabic forms of the name shape very much what we're doing today. So for example, Sevilla, the name uh, that Seville has is greatly affected by the name that the, that the Arabs called it. There are Romance speaking kingdoms that remain in the northern part of Iberia up against the Atlantic Ocean. And they'll gradually expand back down and take over all of Iberia ending in 1492 when Granada is conquered by Castilla. But there'll be Arabic speakers staying in Iberia until after the end of our period. So now we got to get into the kinds of Romance. So all of these languages that today we call Romance languages descend from vulgar Latin. Vulgar means everyday, not rude. So an example of vulgar versus classical Latin is in classical Latin, the word for horse is equus, right? It's the word that, that we use for all kinds of things, including of course, this genus and species name for horses, right? By the time vulgar Latin dominates, the word is caballus, which is of course, what will become cavalier, chevalier, caballero, and of course, you know, caballo as well, right? So the Spanish and French, et cetera, word 
for horse and horseman is tied directly to this vulgar Latin word, not to the classical Latin word. So over time, after the fall of Rome, the language continues to change. It separates out into distinct dialects and things that we'll later call languages. These new kinds of romance first appear in written form starting in the late ninth century. Basically by then Latin has gotten different enough from what people are speaking on the street that people have to begin to write glosses. That is to say, they have to say, this is what this word means. And those are the very first documents we see in Spain are sort of little writing notes saying, no, really the right word for this is this. And then later full text. But again, it won't be until about 1200 that we'll start seeing really substantial text in the vernacular romance as opposed to Latin. And of course, Latin will continue to be used long after the end of our period. So in Western Iberia, the languages that will appear are Portuguese or Portuguese, Portuguese, and Galician, Galego. In Central Iberia, what will dominate is what today we call Castilian, that is modern Spanish, which is called Castellano or Espanol. I should comment really quickly that I, I talk, I do not talk like a Spaniard. I talk like someone who's from the new world and I will continue to talk like someone who's from the new world. And I'll talk a little bit more about those dialectual differences and a little bit more, but I'm not trying to talk like someone who's not from the new world because it's pointless for me to try. Um, but there are also other dialects, maybe languages. So Leonense, Aragonese, um, but all of these are sort of varieties of modern Spanish that are still spoken today. And then along the Eastern Mediterranean coast is Catalan. So Catalan, Catala, is again, a separate kind of language, a separate language that emerges from Romance independently. And all of these are still spoken in the Iberian Peninsula today, along with a whole bunch of other things that one might call dialects of these things and one might call still separate languages. So, Quick history. For those of you who were in my previous class, you saw this, but it's easy to see. So you can see up in the north, we're looking here now at the yellow. So the yellow is the Romance speaking areas. And you can see at this moment, Galicia sort of goes in and out of being part of this entity that here is called Leon and Castile and will come to be called Castile. Navarre is an area that sometimes is Catalan speaking, sometimes tied to France, sometimes speaking Castilian, a little bit of everything. And of course it's Basque country too. And tiny Aragon is about to take over. The Counts of Barcelona will actually become the Kings of Aragon. And that area then speaks both a kind of Castilian, though its own dialect at the time, and also a kind of Catalan. And you'll see as they spread south, they'll take over more and more of the area that had been controlled by, by Arab speaking folks. Sorry, there are a couple of quick jumps in here. Um, and again, we'll see different kinds of dialects spoken in the south as well. And by 1492, then the area is brought together and while it will be a few more years before that happens, it's not until the death of Fernando, which is in 1516, 16, I think, um, that Spain will be united in the name of first Juana la Loca and then her son, the grandson of Fernando, who was king of Aragon, and, Juan, uh, and Isabel, who is queen of Castilla, their grandchild who will be Carlos the first of Spain and the fifth of the Holy Roman Empire. He's often called Carlos V, um, though he was the first there. Here we go. All right. So for a few minutes, I want to talk in broad terms about structures, and then we're going to dive into specific naming cultures and try to make sense out of them because the naming cultures of all these places are kind of related in interesting kinds of ways, but also kind of different. So a really quick note getting started, what I'm about to talk about doesn't work at all for classical Roman names. The, tri the trionomina is a different kind of deal that manages things in very different ways. But the first thing we need to know is about given names. Everybody knows this stuff, but let's just make sure we're all on the same page. So given name is the name that folks usually call you. So like Juliana in my case, right? And then a by name is a kind of name that describes which Juliana. So there are several kinds of by names. And as we do this, we're gonna talk about what's common in Iberia and what's not. So the most common kind of by name in Iberia are patronymic by names. So a patronymic by name says, who's your daddy? Um, Spain in this manner is really very patronymic. There are a 
few cases of names that say who your mom is, but they're really, really rare. At first, and for much of our period, these are literal by names. That is, they literally say who your father is. Later on, they're inherited family names. So for example, we see things early Latinized things like Filia Petri, the daughter of Peter, and then later those forms that are so typical of Spanish Perez, which means the daughter or the son of Peter, right? The second kind of binding that's really common throughout Iberia are locative bindings. These are names that say where you or your family's from, like De Luna. Luna is nothing to do with the moon. Well, I mean, it does etymologically, but you know, it's a place in Aragon where a very famous family is from. Much more rarely, there are descriptive binames, binames that describe some physical or other feature. You can think about things like cuello, which means neck, or you can think about something like pardo, which means spotted, or, you know, here, caballero horseman, right? Even rarer are occupational binames that describe what you do, like barbero, barber, or herrero, smith. The deal is, as far as any of us can tell, is the Spanish just weren't real, is Spanish and, and with them, the rest of the folks, the Iberian Peninsula, were really avoided heavily sort of any sense that, that they actually did real work for, you know, a living and sort of using occupational binames, unlike England, where like occupational binames are everywhere. In the Iberian Peninsula, they're very, very rare. What you see almost exclusively are patronymics and locatives, like, you know, half and more are one or the other. It's, it's, it's really striking, a, very pat a pattern that's very, very different from what you see in Northern Europe, where burghers, that is to say, so in Northern Europe, being a burger, a guildsman, a citizen of a town is really important, and it's what everybody aims to be. In Spain, that's not it. Everyone aims to be an hidalgo, an hijo hidalgo, a child of something. In other words, to be someone who can make a living as a gentry person, right? You can think of that as being like, I don't know, early 19th century England or something in the era of Jane Austen, right? So everyone wants to be gentry. No one wants to work for a living. And so having a name that suggests you work for a living is something to be avoided as much as possible. And so people avoid them, but they do exist. So let's take a case. So El Cid himself, everyone know who El Cid is, right? The 11th century, right? Great conqueror and hero of El Mio Cid. So Rodrigo is his given name. He's also known by the diminutive of Roy. It's spelled R-U-Y or sometimes R-U-I. Diaz is a literal patronymic. His father was named Diego. His children in turn were named Rodrigo Ruiz because they're the children of Rodrigo. So you don't share a by name in this, at this time with your parents. He and his family are from Vivar. It's now known as Vivar del Cid, but obviously wasn't in those days because there wasn't a Cid to be, you know, the Vivar of. Um, it's also spelled with the B. We'll talk about why that is in just a few minutes. Um, as an adult, he acquires two by names. They are Campedactor, or and that's the Latinized form of Campeador, and El Cid. So Campiador means master of the battlefield, the Campo. And he actually signs his name in Latin that way. So he signs his name as Rudericus, which is just, you know, the Latinized form of Rodrigo, Campi Doctor. Yes, we actually have documents he signed his name on. That's so funny and great to think about, right? He's not just a legend, he's a real human being. And then of course, he's also known as El Cid which is derived from Said, the Arabic for Lord. There's no evidence that he used it, but within a century, it appears in histories. Actually, the first histories it appears in are in fact Arabic histories rather than the Spanish ones. So of course, the, the great legend of his will be called, right, El Mio Cid. So let's focus in on Spanish. So let's start by talking a little bit about sounds. So here I'm talking about medieval Spanish. So mostly it's like modern Spanish, but there are a couple of things. So Mostly the vowels are this classic I, A, E, O, U, right? But there is some and some other sounds that appear in a few places, but I'm not gonna try to tell you where. Basically, if you behave as if it's A, A, E, O, U, you'll be in good shape. At that point in time, B and V are still separate. So in modern Spanish, you say ba and va precisely the same way. They are both ba in, um, word initial places, and they're both va and intervocalic between two vowel sites. But in Old Spanish, they're separate. 
So it should be vivar, but in modern Spanish, V-I-V-I-R and B-I-V-A-R and B-I-B-A-R for that matter, all pronounced exactly the same way. So it's not surprising they get changed. Now here's where things are interesting because there are a whole bunch of sounds that by the modern period are gonna collapse down to modern jota. So if you say my name in modern Spanish, it's Juliana, right? But it wouldn't have been in the 16th century or older. So early on, the C with the sedilla is S, as is just a plain C before E and I. You'll notice that Garcia gets spelled both ways. Sometimes it gets a C, sedilla, sometimes it doesn't. But it would have been, in, in medieval Spanish, it would have been Garcia. The sound that's spelled with Z is Z, like in, um, I cannot think of a good word. I can't now, but Z. An S between vowels is pronounced Z, but the double S is Sa. So for example, the word for bear would have been Ozo, as opposed to Oso. X is Sh, and J is Z, like in treasure. So in the 15th century, my name would have been Juliana. Now, in late period, then a group of things happen. The first thing that happens is X and J merges Sh. And you can still see that in some Latin American place names. So there is a place in Guatemala. It's Quetzaltenango, but it's Maya name is Shelahu. And it's written X with an X. And it would have been Shelahu once upon a time, but now it's Shelahu. Um, and partially in Tlaxcala, which is said not with a sh, it would have been Tlaxcala, but today in Spanish it said Tlaxcala, but not Tlaxcala, right? And of course, the name of the people who gave their name to the city of Mexico were the Mexica. So early on, it's Mexico. And then, of course, later as the pronunciation changes, it changes to Mexico. Okay, so then they go down to that modern, I'm using X here for the sound because that's the that we use in, I, in IPA and in the International Phonetic Alphabet to do it. There's no good way to describe that, that H otherwise, right? It's the same as the sound in like Bach and Lach, Mexico. C, Cedilla, and Z first become just S and Z and then eventually all collapse to S. Now, here's where things get interesting. And the reason I want to call wanted to call your attention to that is that this is where the modern Spanish, the, what's sometimes called the Spanish lisp, but we're going to call here distinction split happens. So I, I, I am a seseo person. So I learned to speak Spanish in Latin America where there is no th, there's only sa, right? So I'm a seseo, not a ceseo person, right? But the distinction is that you say th everywhere it was the old s and z. So consider these two words. It's, it's la casa versus la caza. So casa for house, caza for hunt, right? Because it's not just dick thuz everywhere there's an S. There's actually a set of rules to it. And in Castilian, classic Castilian Spanish, we see the ceceo, the distinct, distinct, God, now I can't say it, distinction, right? Where we where they, they, they do the th in certain places, but it's part of this sort of collapse of sounds that were separate in the medieval period, but now are all one thing. So mostly I go by Juliana, but if you call me Juliana, then I'll think you're really smart in 16th century. And if you call me Juliana, then I'll be like, ooh, you think I'm earlier and everything. Um, and I like that about my name. I didn't pick it for that reason, but it's a great sort of example. And like I said, You'll find a whole bunch of places in Latin America that were named in the 16th century that sort of still maintain that sh sound. So it's all there as you think about this. So let's talk about a couple of pieces, a couple more things about orthography. So orthography is just how words are written. Modern Spanish orthography doesn't get standardized until well after periods. So there are a couple of things about that. The first thing is in period, accents are used irregularly which mostly means not, but sometimes they are, and occasionally they're written in kind of weird places. Really early on, you, they haven't even standardized the ny, right? The n with the tilde. And so you, when you see something like a double n or a double n with a y after it, that's just another way of writing the sound ny. We'll talk about how it's written in, in uh, Portuguese in just a few minutes, but in the, like I said, b and v are used kind of interchangeably, y and i are used interchangeably. And then one thing, remember, IJ and UV are used, and this is pretty much true throughout Europe, 
I and J and U and V are used interchangeably. And you have to know from context whether it's the vocalic or the consonantal sound, right? So for example, my name can be written I-U-L-I, but that doesn't mean it's Juliana. It just means they wrote it with an I and it's still Juliana or Juliana or Juliana, right? Same thing, if I stick a U or a V in a place, it doesn't mean it's different. It just means I can use it either way. And you have to know if it's violante, right? Then it's U-I-O, but it's still violante. And if I stick a U, if I stick a V in, in place of U, that doesn't make it not a U, it's just written that way, right? So just remember all of that. So let's start early. So we're gonna look at three different data sets for Spanish. Um, just to get a sense of what they look like. So these are early men's names and early women's names. I just took the most common 10 or so. There are more than 10 for women's names because there were a whole bunch that were two. Um, so some of these names look really familiar. So like Pedro and Garcia and Juan. Um, others look kind of different than the modern forms. So we see instead of Sancho a bunch of times, we see Sancio. Um, because, and we see Sancia because the word Sancho and Sancia comes from the Latin Sanctius and slowly collapses down to Sancho, but along the way, there are all these intermediate forms that have more, that aren't quite sort of into the modern form. Um, we see a whole bunch of forms. So we see, uh, you know, same thing with Didaco. It's another sort of, we're collapsing down to Diego, but we're not there yet. You'll notice that there are a lot of names that they're also names that sort of aren't so familiar, um, especially for the women. I've never seen Adulina after sort of the 13th century. I'm sure it exists once or twice. Berenguela completely disappears, though of course stays in French and in um, Catalan, right? But others that are very popular. Leonor, for example, not surprisingly, anyone wanna guess where Leonor is associated with? What kingdom? Leon, yeah, exactly, right? So give you a sort of sense. Um, you'll also note that I didn't talk about this, but the other thing that hasn't happened is a whole bunch of words that in modern Spanish will have an H, like Hernando still here will have the F, so Fernando. And it's only in the 16th century that we'll sort of see it collapse down to Hernando instead of Fernando. There are a whole bunch of words like that. You might note that the word for Smith, for example, Herrero, in the related languages is Ferrer or Ferrero because it starts with an F. Um, so really quickly, the names in terms of where they come from are a fascinating mess. So they're a whole group of Visigothic names. Most of those long complicated names like Alfonso and Alvaro and Fernando and Gonzalo and Rodrigo are all, um, are all Visigothic. And then there's some other names that are in this data set but are gonna disappear like Bela and Froila that are these little short names that end with A and they're all masculine and they're all Visigothic. They're all so, I know, isn't that interesting? Um, there are a group of names that are Basque in origin. Garcia, Enico, which will become Inigo later on, Velasco, Onica, which also becomes Inyaga, Ximena, probably, though it's, it's an interesting problem, and Uraca, which is also an interesting problem. So it is a word that means magpie, but the question is, does it come from Basque or does it come from Latin thorax? We just don't know. It's like, if you, Literally, you want to get etymologists fighting about something, it's a great thing to get them fighting about because they're fighting words all around that. But so I'm listing it as Basque, but maybe it is, maybe it isn't, it's fun. There are a whole group of biblical names, right? And these have all passed through Latin on their way. So Pedro, which also appears as Piero and all kinds of other forms, Johan, Juan, right? Collapsing down there, Maria, things like that. And then there are a group of names that are just Latin names. So things like Domingo and Martino and Sanctio and Didaco um, and Mayor and all these kinds of things. So, and these all get really mixed up. And in the end, everyone just thinks of them as Spanish names, right? So just to, to sort of get ahead of myself, one of the things that follows from that is that someone who's named Garcia is just as likely not to be a Basque speaker as a Basque speaker. And the famous, the most famous early writers of Basque, none of them have name, have given names that are Basque in origin. We'll get there in just a few minutes. They're the way all biblical names. Or generally kind of, you have to 
it is what it is, right? Because it, the naming practice gets really messy and really complicated very early on and it will never change. So really quick pause before we move on to the 15th century. So the data I just showed you is from an article I never actually got around to publishing, Bad Juliana, but you can find similar names in sort of these two different articles, one written by Antonio. I know it says Miguel, but eventually he stuck Antonio on the front of it. So he's Antonio now. And the other one by Diego, there's a lot of other data out there too. Um, there's also a whole book full of names from this period by um, a guy whose surname is Diaz Melcon. That's just fantastic. All right. So now let's go forward, bump forward to the late 15th century and to the Spanish names we know and love, right? Because now when we look at these, these look very like sort of my classic image of what Spanish names look like. So 20% of men are named Juan, like 20% are named Maria. Um, you'll notice that there is a great sort of variability of accents. The other thing that's really fun about this data, so this is data, as I said at the, we, at the very start, this is data that's from Isabel's account book. So Isabella Catolica, the queen of Castile for you know big chunks of the 15th century, sorry. Yeah, I said it right, big chunks of the 15th century. Her, her treasurer kept a set of account books and eventually they got published and I got my hands on them and I took names out of them. So there are a whole bunch of diminutives in this that you don't see in other kinds of records. And that's because she's one of the groups of people who she's paying is she's paying servants, right? Because this is like every bit of money she gives. And so somebody comes in and entertains her and they do a good job, she gives them money. All of her servants, she gives them money, you know, every 12th night, they get money to buy a new, to, or, or clothing to get, or, you know, either new clothing or cloth to make clothing or money to get cloth to make clothing, right? It's part of what they get. And so there are more diminutives in this data than anywhere else I've ever seen. And you'll notice all of them are in, all of them involve sort of adding Ica or Ica or Ita or Ito or Ico to them. And so, you know, they certainly were used. Um, so, you know, but you don't normally see them in more formal kinds of text, but you'll also see that spelling is still all over the place. So like Francisco, there's a, there's one version of Francisco that has a Cicidia stuck in it. I'm pretty sure it was Francisco, but on the other hand, it's also there with, remember I said that the C early on is T, uh, and now they're just kind of sticking it in because it's like there or not, or maybe, but it's already begun to collapse, right? So it's already, yeah, exactly. Um, in Garcia, it should be there, right? It's always there in really old versions of Garcia, it's there. Right, so that one is like, that should be there, but it's not always there, right? They're kind of an interesting mess, right? So this is lots of fun. Again, these are the most common names. Uh, and you know, they're not surprising. So for women, Maria, Isabel, Catalina, Juana, Ines, Beatriz, Francisca, Leonor, Ana, and Teresa. Not at all surprising. Uh, for the men, Juan, Pedro, Diego, Fernando, Though you'll note there are also Hernando forms there. And I, I think that, that this is one of the periods where Fernando and Fernan or Hernando and Hernan are sort of used interchangeably. So for example, if you ever go look at stuff about Cortez, right, the conqueror of Mexico, you'll see his name spelled both as Hernando and Hernan, because both were used kind of interchangeably, one sort of a short form of the other, but they're both used. Alonso Francisco Rodrigo, which sticks around because, you know, the Cid, Martin. Gonzalo and Garcia, right? So again, kind of predictable. In this data, we can talk about by names. So over 50% of the people in this who had by names, there are all kinds of people whose by names aren't listed in this. And some of them aren't listed because they're mentioned a million times, right? So the queen's kids, for example, that we never give by names for them because, you know, if I say I'm giving money to my kid, I don't, say that my kid has a surname, right? You know, cause I wouldn't in my own books either, right? And not all the servants, especially low ranking people have, have surnames given. And sometimes when people are mentioned over and over, they don't have surnames given. And I was really cautious about making sure they're the same people. But of the people who have surnames listed, 50% are simple locative surnames. They're just day plus place name. 55% of men and 51% of women with surnames had surnames of this type. Another, 
about 15%, 10% of men, 20% of women use simple patronymic by names. And then I just gave you a set. So one of the things I want you to notice is it's still the dominant form is still that easy ending. Um, but there are also a whole group of relatively newer names and a few older ones. I don't know why Alonzo, other than Alonzo sounds really weird. I mean, it just still sounds weird to me. But Alonzo and Alessandre and Damian don't get made into by names in that way. They know how to do it. They're still generating new ones, but a lot of names just don't get changed that way. So we start seeing unmarked patronymic by names. There are unmarked patronymic by names earlier, but they sort of break the rules. But by this time, you can sort of I'm sort of at the point where I, I say, I can't tell you what the answer is, but if you tell me what a man's given name is, I'll tell you what I think the by name will be. And then I'll go look at it off, but I'll be right 95% of the time, whether they'll change, whether they'll add the easy or not. So it's like, it's like up here, but I can't articulate it. And it's a combo of what the name sounds like and how new the name is. Old names almost always do except Alonzo. And like I said, I think it's just because Alonzo sounds so bizarre. But on the other hand, I mean, check out Yanyes Ibanyes, that's John. So Juan isn't too weird to do it. And Yanyes or Juanes sounds too weird to me too, so whatever. Um, there are other descriptive binames, but they're pretty rare. There's no, none of them, to, none of them are more than 1% of the total number of binames. About 7% of men, 3% of women have two element surnames. They are almost all just a patronymic element with a locative element. So Fernandez de Irena, Ruiz de Ascona, Ponce de Leon. But we also see a few other kinds of things. So the famous Hurtado de Mendoza family, where Hurtado is a different kind of by name. It's not a, it's not a, a locative, but also things like Pedro's Victoria and Alonso Nino. So a few other kinds of things. So again, there's the source. This is from my Spanish names from the late 15th century. It's got about 2,000, the name's about 2,000 people. So you can go like look in there for a Spanish name. Um, and they've got some weird unusual ones as well as the really normal ones. And of course, they're from the court of Castile. So after that, names from the high nobility get complicated. So this data, I'm not, this isn't published data and it's impossible for me to do anything with it. But basically what I did is there's a book by, um, uh, de Atien, de, Julio de Atienza, which is called Nobiliario Español. And basically what it is, is it's a book about coats of arms, but it's modern. It's not, I mean, it's not period, but it has a bunch of stuff about, about proofs of Hidalgaria. So in late period and one past period, one of the things that you want to do is you want to prove your individual nobility and hence your ability to, to carry arms. This is done by proving that all of your grandparents were armigerous. There are other ways to get arms, but this is by far the easiest, right? And so there are all these, there's, there's sort of a, there becomes an increasingly large business in these Cuevas de Adalgaria. And every single one of them, they got the names, right? And so the Atienza is going through and sort of citing people's names from this period. They're, they're standardized, so I don't actually trust the spellings. But what I do trust is that the forms of them are straight out of the, 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 these Cuevas, right? And so I started going through looking for complex kinds of patterns in this book. And I'll cheerfully talk more about this book. But like I said, I because the name elements were modernized, I didn't use them very much. But there are two given names from time to time, but they're rare. There is a single example we found with three given names. She's a princess. This is Isabel Eugenia Clara, who is the daughter of Philip II, who is Carlos, Carlos's son. So find me two more, we can register that pattern, but I just haven't seen them, right? And like I said, she's a princess. Two is good enough for most of us. Family names get longer. There are examples with three and even four elements. The most common is a patronymic by name followed by multiple locatives. Basically the, the patronymic followed by a locative is the way to say, I am someone important. I am back to this, you know, Hidalgo, right? Which is sort of the term used for gentry and better. And Hidalgo means literally hijo de algo. That's where it comes from, or at least where it's said to come from, right? But one thing is all the way through our period, by names are just weird. There are cases where siblings don't use the same by name. 
I can usually sit down with a group of siblings if I know something about the family and they're using different names, I can figure out like, so he's using his father's name and she's using her mother's name. And this kid is using like their grandmother's name. What the heck is that? You know, so they all are family names, but they're not closely related and not the same ones. Um, so you asked, the, so, so Hagar asked the question of Ava versus Anna. No, I don't think they're variants of the same name. I think they're separate. Um, I think Ava is, is, um, is attested later. It's just not common, right? So what happens is in the 10th and 13th century, it's, it's all these Germanic names and Basque names and a few biblical names. And then they settle into the, what I would call the normal European pattern, right? Because almost all of those names are just names you find everywhere, right? So, and Anna's one of them, Anne, right? In fact, just as a reminder in all of this, uh, relatively recently, somebody posted to Facebook uh, the question of essentially, if, you, um, if you're a white woman, you know, what's your middle name and why is it Elizabeth or Anne? Right? <laughs> because they're that common, right? Um, there is, Isabel is the Spanish form of Elizabeth. Isabella, Isa, so the, the, basically you can see this really clearly in Italian. I'm gonna put some stuff in the chat. In the chat, in, in Italian, you see Elisabetta and Lisabetta, right? And then you see Lisabella. And this is sort of a weird form here because you see what they're doing is they're, they're here, they're making a category error, right? Because Betta and Bella are both diminutives. Right, and so then it becomes Isabel. So that's the form of Elizabeth. Yeah, I know, who'd have thought? Um, so at what point do three given names come into vogue? Let me begin by saying that three given names really are never in vogue, right? Normal people never have three given names even today in Spain, right? But it's certainly true as the 18th century goes on, noble women get more, noble people get more and more and more names, including by the way, by names, right? Because there are families now that have like sequences of eight different family names that tell us how important they are, right? They're mostly like, you know, peers, dukes and stuff, right? Um, but I don't actually know off the top of my head because I sort of stop in 1650 in my head, right? Because I, I don't do research on names sort of in a broader kind of sense. It's mostly medieval kinds of stuff, but it's a good question. Uh, but my answer is kind of really never. So let's look at some really late data. Like I say, mostly it's the same. So this is from um, Elspeth Ann Roth who did a, she did a study of these are from um, the uh, Catalogo de Pasajeros a Indias. So this is the catalog of the passengers to the Indies. It's a group of 16th century volumes that have been published. That's a list of everyone who was given permission to travel to the new world. So it, it lists everybody in the party usually. So it's, you know, mom and dad and the kids and everybody's names. So there's lots of women's names as well as lots of men's names. Again, here I'm just showing you surname stuff. Here again, half the names are given name. Almost everyone here has a surname, but some of the servants don't. Almost half the given names are, almost half of them are given name plus locative. So like Juan de Palencia, Maria de Recalde, a third are given name plus patronymic, Bartolome Gomez, Catalina Gonzalez, Juan Martin. Five to 10% have, have something else. So Calvo, which means bald, La Roja, which means the red, Aleman, which means from Germany, right? About 5% are given, or sorry, are patronymic and locatives like Juan Martinez de Palategui. Um, that, by the way, Basque country. Um, and a few others, less than 1%, that's combinations like Sanchez Aleman. So again, so here's what I haven't found. The first one is names derived from attributes of Maria, like Luz and Mercedes and Guadalupe. So names like Maria de los Mercedes come into use in the late 17th century. So this is of course Maria of the Mercies, right? And then Mercedes becomes later on an independent name, but it's sometime after that. So I haven't yet seen any of those names in period. Anything that's named from an appearance of Mary, an attribute of Mary, so no Lords, no Guadalupe, no Mercedes, no Luz, sorry. Um, 
I'd love to find it. If anybody finds it, let me know because I'm really, I'd be excited by it. But, you know, we've been looking and we haven't found it. The other thing that you don't see is the modern Spanish sort of pattern, which is using the family name from your, the patronymic from your father and from your mother, right? Indeed, I don't see any, com any, any normal combination of family names from both sides, right? You get, I, I have occasionally seen people who've used like a uh, uh, patronymic from my father's family and a locative that my mother, from my mother's family, but my mom is like, you know, Martinez de Guadalupe, I'm making stuff up right now. And dad is Otunia, so it's Otunia's de Guadalupe, which doesn't, you know, there's no way it makes sense in any kind of modern pattern. Um, and so you'll see some things that look like modern family names, but one, they're not real normal. And two, they're not, they didn't come from one from mom and one from dad. They just didn't. I don't really know when that pattern started. Um, clearly, it's a modern pattern and very common one, but you just don't see it. Also, you know, I should note really quickly here, on the whole, people also don't change their name on marriage, right? Legally, in most of Latin America, that's still true. So you don't actually change your name legally, though you may though a woman may be known as Senora, her husband's name, or Senora de husband, they husband's name. But you know, if you go look at her at her cedula, at her her ID card, it'll usually have her maiden name on it because you know there's not that same pattern. Um, so. It wouldn't surprise me to see it occasionally, though I have to say, I always wonder in family search if someone is making it up, right? I mean, if someone is forming it from, sometimes, you know, what you see with baptisms in particular, with a baptism, you'll see what you very frequently see with a baptism is, let's do me, is Juliana, the daughter of such and such and so and so, right? And there's actually no family name given for the kid at all. And so it's just something to worry about. Sorry, I. While trying to hit the chat, I managed to hit that. Um, so I just don't know, right? I, I don't know. I just, you know, I always worry about that because, you know, those things. Okay, so let's talk about Portuguese first. I'm really not going to get to Catalan. I already admitted that when I started putting this together. So again, the writing, the spelling in Portuguese, if you thought the Spanish stuff was weird, the Portuguese is politely all over the place, right? So the way you write the sound enya, the, the enya sound, nya, is written nh. You'll also see just nn. The ya or lya sound is written lh. Si sedia is t, a vowel, a tilde over the vowel means it's nasal, just like that French thing, right? So like modern sao, right? Sao is from santo, and the, the, the n disappears and the, the vowel is just nasalized. But when you try to make sense out of this, um, Man, it's a disaster. So let's look at some data. So in the 13th and 14th century, so this is, sorry, this is 14th and 15th century. Um, and you can see, sort of get a sense of it. Stuff written in lots of different kinds of ways, way more spelling variability than you see in Spanish, but all, a lot of the same kind of elements, right? Um, so Beatriz, so often spelled Beatriz. Enes, which is a form of Inez, Leonor, Maria, Teresa, Tereja, Aldonza, so on and so forth. The men are pretty similar. Johan, Gonzalo, Martin, Martin, Mart. And you'll notice here we've got Martinho. Is it really Martinho? I doubt it, but that's how it's written. It should be pronounced with that writing. It should be written Martinho, but everywhere else it's Martino. So I don't know. The writing is crazy. Um, Pretty similar kinds of things. So single element by names, 43% of the one of the, the, the things. Patronymics, locatives, more of the others, and interestingly, more two element names in this data. This is again courtly data, but so was the data from um, so somebody asked what's Berengera. It's it's actually, so let's go back. It falls out of use in Spanish. It's a name that you see in Occitan a whole lot, which is the French version of Catalan, but you see it if you go all the way back. It's in that list. This is the 10th to 13th century data. It's five from the bottom. Berenguela. So it's 
early in Spain, also in, and it's kept in Portuguese and it's kept in um, in Occitan and uh, oops, it's kept in Occitan and in um, and in Portuguese, at least through the 14th century. I think it disappears after that. I don't think I've seen a later version of it in Portugal, but don't hold me to that. It might be. Lord knows stuff is weird. People are weird. Names are weird. It's one of the fun things about them. Um, and when we get to the 16th century, look, it looks just like everywhere else. So there we have Isabel, Maria, Catarina, Ana, Still Beatrice versions, though, remember in Portuguese, they flip the vowels, so it's Beatrice, Leonor, Margarida, um, Ines, Antonia, Francisca. It gets way more boring. But the men's spellings get crazy. And when I look at them, I don't even know how to, like, I don't even know how to make some of them into the right kind of thing with there. It's, so, so somebody observes that it, it sounds like Berenjena, but it's not tied to the word for, for eggplant. It's an old Germanic name and you see it in France too. So it's part, of, it's part of that sort of old Frankish thing. And it's possible that the sound, it's possible that it affected what we ended up with as the word for eggplant, but there's no direct tie between the two. Um, by the way, just as a sort of weird, stupid thing, um, just as a weird, stupid thing, um, it turns out that the English name Rosa isn't from the word rose either. It's from the word cross horse. And then only later to people, but we know because we can see the early versions of it. The early versions of it aren't the word for rose. It's things like Rohisha. And then it becomes Rosa. And then everyone's like, it's Rose. And then it's Rose, right? Because, you know, sometimes you have these things where they look the same. For what it is worth, somebody mentioned Berengaria Swamp. I'm sure it is named for the same thing, though it's using, again, a version of it from French rather than a version of it from Spanish, but it's the same name. Because names, names are like that. Uh, again, overwhelmingly one by name. And here are some examples of what the more complicated ones look like. Um, it's fun. And again, here is the data source. So. I'm not gonna have the time for Catalan because Catalan's a little bit more different, but here are the sources you want for Catalan names. Again, yeah, Berenguer is the masculine version of it, right? So Berenguer and Berenguera are a pair. Berenguer is the masculine, Berenguer is the feminine. So yeah, it's all the same name. Um, Catalan, so there are people in the Catalan speaking areas who have names that look really Spanish, but the also, sort of the forms are a little different and you see way more unmarked patronymic by names and way, because they don't use that easy form. That's, that's typical of the Western part of Iberia, but not the Eastern part of Iberia. So you can take a look there. And then I want to stop and talk about Basque names and then I'll answer questions until people get bored. Um, You've got a soft 10 minute warning, but the class after you was canceled, so. Yeah, yeah, I know. I saw somebody post that, so I'm, I will take advantage of it. So here's the weird, disappointing thing about Basque names, and that is that Basque names aren't. So everyone has this expectation that you'll like be able to look at names and say, oh, look, it's a Basque name. So the first elements that appear in Basque, I'll answer names about horses and stuff later on, are, so the first people to write in Basque, the first written documents in Basque are in the 16th century. It's so disappointing. I wish there were a whole bunch of Basque stuff earlier. There's data from Basque country that's earlier, but it's all written down in romance. But here we go. So modern Bernard Estepère, et, sorry, Estepère is the first guy to write a book in Basque. And he wrote his name as Bernard de Chepere. Notice one thing about his given name, it's Bernard. And it's, he's using here the, the Catalan from Bernat as opposed to the, the Spanish from Bernardo, same name now. In other words, he didn't have a best given name at all. His given name is, you know, just a standard sort of biblical name. Now, Bernardo is not a good biblical name. It's a saint's name now. So the first guy, the first letter we have in Basque was written by Juan Zumaraga, who was the first Bishop of Mexico. He wrote it in 1537. Again, look at his name. His name is Juan. Again, not a Basque name. It's a saint's name. 
By the way, in both cases, their by names are in fact locatives from Basque country. And you know, both of them also wrote in Basque. So I took the names here. Here I took the names that are in the Basque part of the letter. Most of the letters written in Castilian, but he wrote one part in Basque. And in it, he mentions the the fantastically Basque name of Maria Ruiz, who, by the way, is a Basque woman, but her name is Maria Ruiz, right? And also his friend Anso Garcia. So again, remember Garcia by origin is, but it's not. And Anso again is found in other places too. It's kind of Basque. In that case, that's a name that's probably originally Basque etymologically. And, you know, just a sort of normal place and a place named Montserrat, which is in fact a Basque place. So in the end, there are names that are linguistically Basque. And there are names that Basque people had, but the relationship between being Basque and having a name that's Basque in origin and period is problematic. Um, you know, great Basque names like Juan, which, you know, just a really quick note, let me just say this really clear that, um, that it is also true, right, that Juan isn't a Spanish name either. Right? I mean, all of it goes back to an Aramaic name that has gone through about a million different forms. So what I'm saying is that, that when I say that one isn't a Basque name, all I mean is that it's not a name that's etymologically Basque, right? It is a Basque name. How do I know it's a Basque name? Because a dude who is Basque had that name, right? And that makes it a Basque name. But our idea that Basque people had names that were linguistically Basque and not Basque people didn't have names that were, lingui that were linguistically Basque isn't true, right? Lots of guys, if I met a guy whose name was, you know, for example, Velasco Garcia, my first thought would be, my first thought, because I think that way would be, wow, that's a really Basque name etymologically, but would I expect the guy to be Basque? Not at all. Not at all. And you know, if I met a guy named Juan Sanchez, which has not a single Basque element in it, he might very well be Basque, right? I mean, there's just no connection between those things once we get past, you know, anywhere that we might think of as the high middle ages. And again, I've looked at, um, I, I haven't done anything with this yet, partly because I couldn't figure out what towns for sure were really Basque speaking, but I've looked through, there's a mid 14th century um, census of Navarra and I went and looked through areas that were clearly at least close to Basque country and the names were just like everywhere else. They were exactly the same given names. The surnames, the surnames were kind of interesting because they had Basque place names in them. The given names, eh, kind of all the same. So the answer is, so let me, let me go back and answer that question. Is it Montserrat? I don't actually know. I never did figure out where this place was because I, I literally, I knew this letter existed and I went to, I go back from time to time and get the, um, and get the, the, um, the, the names out of it, but I don't actually know where he's writing about. So I don't know. It's certainly a place that's etymologically probably the same thing, but I don't know. Um, so somebody asks if men were also named Rose for horses. The answer is um, that Yes, there are some names that use that Ross element. If you go back to like Anglo-Saxon, which is where you find these names, which makes it clear where Rose is coming from. Um, but I can't off the top of my head think of what any of them are. But if you bug me offline, I'll go look for some. But yeah, it's not just, you know, it, it, it's one of those things. Um, again, Berenguer and the like is, is actually, it's a two element name. And I don't actually know. So if I if I'm right in my in my thinking, Baron is probably related to Bear, but I don't know for sure that that's true. And Gear is not actually the same as the word for war, I don't think. But I don't actually remember the etymology of Guerra, so I uh, Guerra War in Spanish, so it's possible that that's a Visigothic word too. But you know, it really is sort of what you see in these in these um, Germanic names. What you see is dithemic names. So there's one first part and one second part, and you can kind of see them. You really see them if you look at Anglo-Saxon names or Frankish names. There's a bunch of there's this huge collection of French names, 
that are Frankish from the same period that are Germanic, right? And lots of names that we think of as French are actually not Romance, they're Germanic, just like these, these names in Spain. And you can start seeing the, the first elements and the second elements and how they're put together. Uh, but in, in Spain, the number of names that survives with that small enough that nobody pays very much attention to the bits and pieces. So it becomes really hard for me to remember what they are because we don't actually pay very much attention to them. Um, If you bug me about it, if you bug me, if someone wants to bug me about the origin of guerra, I'll go look, but I don't remember. Um, so does, for, for those of you who read Spanish well, do you all know about corde? So this isn't etymological, but let me just show you a few things. So um, So, change this. So this is the Real Academia Español, or Española, sorry, the, the Royal Academy of Spanish. And these guys keep the dictionary of Spanish. And so the first thing you can do here is you can in fact just look and see what it will tell you. It doesn't have very much etymological data, but that's not really what I wanna show you. What I really wanna show you is this. Oh, come on, you're going to be difficult and not show up. Corde, or the Corpus de Diacronico de Español, is the place to find all the citations. So what you can do if you're looking for a name, especially for surnames that you can't find anywhere else, this is a good place to look. So let's just look at that version of it. I usually limit it in time because I want to look at things from before 1650. And it will show you all the places where this shows up. So this particular spelling of Berenguela turns up 81 cases in seven documents. And if you just hit recuperar, it will tell you, oh, look, and most of them are about a queen, not surprisingly. So one annoying feature of Corday that I should point out is that Corday is case sensitive. So if you put in a small b, it will only find the cases that are small b. So you have to go back and do a search again with the capitalized b or it won't find them because it doesn't know they're the same thing. It's not very sensitive that way, but it's a load of fun. So um, somebody asked if there's a period practice of giving the name for the saint of the birthday. It doesn't look that way. Clearly that's very much, for example, the modern Mexican in particular tradition is to name someone after the day, that's the saint of the day in question, that they're born. That pattern doesn't seem to exist. And you know, you can see that by the fact that a huge fraction of the men are named Juan. And, and while there are in fact multiple feast days for multiple Johns, right? So there's John the Evangelist and there's John the Baptist. It isn't 20% of the days, right? It might work for Maria, but it doesn't for one. So, you know, what you're seeing there is not people being named for saints days. Um, thank you for putting that up. I should have, I, I should have put that up. So um, we don't see that. We don't even see that in all seriousness. It, when we go to sort of the one case where we know a heck of a lot about the details is turning our attention to the new world, um, which again, that's, that's another class, but so in the new world, what you see is you see people being baptized and they do one of two things. Sometimes they do both of two things. The first thing is that they take a new baptismal name that's a saint's name. Their old Indian name, I put that in square quotes because of course there is no such language as Indian, right? There's Nawa and there's Yucateco and there's Quechua and there's Aymara and right, all those other things, right? Becomes a, essentially a new surname. Um, and then they also sometimes take the surname of their godparent, especially if their godparent is someone important. So that, for example, one of the earliest um, indigenous people to be baptized will come to be known as Diego Colon, because Colon is, of course, Columbus, same name, right? Because, in fact, he is his, when he's baptized, he's named after 
Christopher Columbus. And that, of course, is in 1492, just to be clear in case anybody was doubting that. Incidentally, Diego is also the name of the actual legal son of one of one of Christopher Columbus's actual legal sons. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, this this interpret this guy who's kidnapped and made to be an interpreter also shares that name, but he does. But again, even among the Indians who are baptized, like the people who are baptized on the same day take different names. So there's not even there kind of a, a set sort of thing. Um, again, I don't know when that starts. That's a really interesting question. Um, and, you know, it's certainly true that it's, it's very much in lots of rural parts of Mexico that was a pattern for a very long time, but I don't really know when it starts. The first time I remember being sort of boggled by it was when I met a guy whose name was Refugio, because it was the, 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 the festival of Nuestra Señora de Refugio, the refuge, right? And so his name was Refugio or Cuco. Um, so anything else I can answer? I think there's I that hit everything in the chat. I, hmm? what? we covered everything in the chat. We've just recently hit the hour. Um, yep. There is another class going on in the other room, but there isn't a class yep. in this room. So I will cheerfully stay and talk and answer questions for as long as people want. So one thing I will say is go poke around those articles because while I shared the most common names, because I think that's the that's the thing that helps to get a sense of the what what's going on, right? Is look at what's really common, but there's also all kinds of weird and interesting stuff because some of those data sets have literally thousands of names or thousands, I shouldn't say thousands of names, thousands of people, right? Hundreds of whom are named Juan. Yep. Ricardo is definitely Germanic in origin. Um I don't know when Ricardo arrived. You know, one of the things that's interesting, so if you're trying to find stuff that's post period, there are two things you can do. One of them is you can use Corday, not limiting it. But the other thing you can do is you can go to family search. So this is a sort of interesting mess. So family search is a project of the Mormons, right? So the LDS church believes that you can, you know, baptize people posthumously. And so one of the projects they have is helping everybody who, who wants to convert to be able to track down all of their family members going deep into the past so they can baptize them, so they can go to heaven. Because you see, you can't go to Mormon heaven unless you're baptized. So anyway, or no, maybe you can, but you can't be the right thing in Mormon heaven unless you're baptized. So you baptize people posthumously. Um, yeah, so as, as Chandra says, it is wonderful and problematic in origin. And so... You have to be careful about using it because 75% of it is really good and the rest of it's junk, right? So specifically, you want to search records, not people's family trees, because people say all kinds of crazy things in their family trees, um, including, you know, modernizing names and occasionally making up names and, you know, all kinds of other things. Um, but if you look at records, they're mostly pretty good, but occasionally people do, again, difficult things. So Chandra and I sort of had a weird little exchange in there about, she observed that she had found examples in family search that looked like they were doing the modern Spanish thing of taking on mom's surname, uh, dad's, dad's first surname and mom's first surname. And I said, but that assumes that they're not making up surnames for kids because often the baptism records say, kid given name, kid of this person and that person, and they don't actually give the kid a surname at all. And, and you know, that that's still true today, right? So when, on a completely different note, right, when I was baptized, it was, you know, Julia Elizabeth, not Julia Elizabeth Smith, daughter of, right, John Smith and Helen Smith, but not I wasn't given any kind of surname in that because that's not how you do those things, right? So, I mean, it's still true today that you see that pattern sometimes where one person's surnames aren't mentioned because they're, they're everybody else's are, right? So just something to think about and all that. And, you know, then there's also the problem of, can you actually read, could they actually read the, the old handwriting, right? Because old handwriting, not easy stuff. So what else do people want to know? I will cheerfully answer questions. I'm actually going to hop off to start transcribing this recording and converting that so we can get that up. Okay, um, thank you. You need to stop it first. It's apparently still recording. Yes.
So I'm gonna, I'm stopping the recording guys, heads up.